I'm so thankful you've decided to join me for part two of a five part series entitled Becoming a Dynamic Duel. That's a term that a friend of ours gave to my wife and I as he spent a lot of time with us. He just says, you two are such a dynamic duel. Well, that's how God designed it to be. And that's what God desires for your marriage, that the two of you will become one and you'll be a dynamic duel for God. So my title, my, my second title in this five-part series is entitled, Who is the One? It's a vital question that I had to ask in my life, in my marriage, to determine who was really in charge of the marriage, who was really behind it. So I pray that you'll listen to your two choices. The first choice is found in John uh, chapter 1, verse 4. It says, in him was life. In Jesus Christ, not in me, but in Jesus Christ is the life. In him was life, and the life, Jesus' life, was the light of men. So Jesus in me is to be the light that shines through in my life and my marriage. That's the first option that you have, and you can choose that. And we're going to discuss about choosing that here too. The second option that you have is just a couple verses down further, verse 11. Uh, it says, he came unto his own. So Jesus comes to his own. He comes to me personally, and he comes to every person on planet Earth. Whether they profess Christianity or not, doesn't make an issue. He's no respecter of persons. So he came unto his own, and his own received him not. In other words, you can choose. You can choose to receive Christ as the light of your marriage, or you can choose to resist him. What is your choice going to be? So I want to take you through our personal testimony rather quickly so that you can see the process that Sal and I went through and how we gained uh, becoming a dynamic duel. And I hope that you can put yourself in and enter in to the aspects that uh, uh, you'll discover in your life. And there may be additional aspects that the God's Spirit will whisper to your conscience that are unique to you. But the important thing is, is that you honestly ask yourself, who is the one in your marriage? So Sal and I were high school and college sweethearts. I'm taking you back to 1967 and a little bit beyond that. So I'm going back quite a ways here, 55 years. So, but Sal and I really were, we were high school and college sweethearts. And let me tell you, we were connected. We were in love. I, I don't know if anybody had as good as courtship as Sally and I did. Uh, we were, we spent every free moment we could together. It didn't matter if we were separated, we'd call on the phone. If not, we'd write letters, we'd get together. I mean, every free mo moment we had. We were like uh, Mud and Jeff, as they say. We were like uh, Velcro. We wanted to be together, connected all the time. Uh, we couldn't get enough of each other. Honestly, we just, we could, our, our cup, even though it was overflowing, could not be even more overflowing. It was a beautiful experience we had. We courted for five years. If you could have seen my college notebooks, and I went to a college that was uh, up in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Sally went to a college down in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We were at least five hours apart driving distance, five, six hours apart. But if you could see my college notebooks, what I'd be listening in my different courses, what did I have written on those notebooks? Sally, little hearts around, little arrows through them, you know, always thinking of Sally, always, always on my mind. It's beautiful. God designed it to be that way because she was the girl of my dream. She was everything I'd ever hoped for. And then we got married on March 25th, 1972. And yes, we had our 50th wedding anniversary this March. Our kids surprised us with a beautiful, beautiful get together and party. But anyways, we got married and that's all we wanted. We never wanted to part. And as soon as we got married, the eroding process started. And it happens in almost absolutely every marriage. So for us, the eroding process that hit us is that Sally was a registered nurse. She was an RN. And so, because she was just out of college, they gave her the night shift. 
So when I come home, she goes to work. And then I'm home lonely at night. And when she comes home, I go to work. And we were like two shifts now, passing in the in the night. We had we had more togetherness when we were courting than when we were married. And the devil knows that. He sees his opportunity. So we bought a, a, a new home. In fact, we bought it when we were still in college, pretty brave of us. And pretty soon that home wasn't enough. It was a nice brand new home, 1,200 square feet, cute little place. And uh, we wanted a, a, a more deluxe home. So we designed what we considered at that time with our finances, the home of our dreams. And we moved into that home in a really, really nice subdivision, really nice lot. And then we decided we wanted to upgrade from there. And we're just in our, our late 20s right now. And so we, we, we moved to a country property with 40 acres, its own pond, its own springs, down a dead end of two roads. Uh, it was an all-cedar log home, beautiful place. Fireplace, everything, the works, back patio, everything. So we, this eroding process starts taking us from each other. And now we're being thrown into our professions and we're being thrown into our uh, possessions, if you will. So I wanted a fancy car. I've had a lot of cars in my life, but back then it was a 1976 uh, Chevrolet Monte Carlo with a Landau roof, cherry red with a white Landau roof. Boy, I thought I was everything. But do you see the eroding process is starting to happen? It's no longer just Sally and I. It's what we're achieving. It's who we are. I wanted my own business, and I, I went out to set up my own business because I, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be an important person. And I think a lot of people strive with that. I didn't know that I was an important person because I was in love. I had everything I needed when I married Sally. So I set out to make lots of money. And gradually, more and more and more time is going to the things that I talked to you about and less and less and less time for each other. Stress came into our life. Anxiety came into our life. Uh, busy, busy, busy. We got involved in boards. We got involved in social committees. We're family, friends, you know, active uh, in our sports, our hobbies. Uh, it just was tearing us apart. It was a terrible eroding process. And then someone introduced us to the scriptures. Wow, was that a wake-up call? I mean, I never read the scriptures in my life. So I became, in a process of about four years, of what I would consider a fundamental Christian conservative. Now I was a Bible-believing, not bad, Bible-thumping, not so good, soul-winning. Over a dozen people were baptized into our local church from uh, our outreach with Sally and I, evangelistically minded, King James Version, of the Bible, doctrinally correct, lifestyle reform. We became uh, pure vegetarians, not bad from a beer drinking, marble smoking, meat eater, right? We were lifestyle reformed, denominationally centered Christians. That was our process. It wasn't, I wasn't always right in everything that I believed, but I was never in doubt that I was right, if you know what I'm talking about. A little bit arrogant. Just ask my brothers and sisters and ask my parents. And I'm not too proud of that, to be honest, Lee, but that was the journey that we were on. And in that process, we're about 30, 31 years old now, Sal and I had the biggest fight in our life. And I've shared this before, but I want to share it again because it was my wake-up call. I had a wake-up call when I accepted the Bible, but I was still the one in charge. Remember the title of this message, Who's in Charge? And the biggest fight of my life really woke me up to see who was in charge. And because I was very successful, I had a lot of clients during the day. I, I skipped my noon hour and uh, started to get a stress headache because uh, I didn't have anything to eat. 
I was pushing myself too much. I wanted to make more money. By the time I came home, I was wound up. Oh, I was tighter than a tight spring. And I walked in the house and my lovely wife had a fresh dress on. She had showered or her hair was perfect. The table was all set. She had my favorite meal on. My two boys, who were age three and five at the time, were sitting there. And I sat down. I was the head elder of my church by now. <laughs> I sat down and had prayer. Sally goes to the stove, brings over and puts these sloppy white potatoes. I love hash browns, and they're called brown for a reason, because you brown them, but she, she wanted to cook without oil to be even more healthy, and you can't brown potatoes without oil. And I blew, and I blew, and I blew, and I'm not proud of that. When I got done blowing, I threw Sally out of the house. I locked the doors. I put my two crying boys up to bed, and I began the pace in my house for one and a half hours saying, what is the matter with me? I, I now accept the Bible as the rule of my life. I can tell you who the beast is over the ocean on seven hills, but there's this beast that's still ruling in me. And I said, what's wrong? What, what, what am I missing? And I, I would wager to say that as you're listening, you know something's missing in your life. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you know something is missing. And it isn't just religion, by the way, my friends. I had religion, and religion wasn't enough for me. I'm sorry. Religion is only supposed to connect you to a power outside of yourself, and it didn't do that for me. It connected me to it rather than the God of religion. So there was a Hitler inside of me. Finally, I unlocked the door. Sally came in, and she, she had this, this timid fear look in her eyes of her husband. And I had to say to myself, we got to do something different. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. I couldn't just go through the same routine, even though I had a good conservative church. I believe in the Bible. There was something that that church did not know. And there's a lot of things that the churches are not telling you today. A lot of the churches today only take you to first or second base. And if you're playing baseball, that's not good enough. You got to get home runs every day. And they're not helping their people get home runs. And that was me. I wasn't getting home runs. Although I was on first or second base, I felt pretty good about it. So I said, Sally, I, I picked up the phone and I called my office manager. He says, we're not coming in for 10 days. We went up in the, into the wilderness of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And there the Lord said, Jim, you have a problem. And the problem was I and Christ are one and I am the one. Are you following what I'm saying? Don't miss this. I've said this before in many other messages, but this is so vitally that you must make this transition. If not, all you are is a foolish virgin at best, at best. Jim, as long as you are in charge, things won't change. And that's the bottom line, whether that's your personal life or your marriage or friendship or whatever. As long as you, as long as Jim Holberg is the one in charge, things don't change. Or you can massage over it, you can put on a front, you can be a fraud, but they don't really change. So I had to learn to change one word. I and Christ are one, and he, he is to be the one. And that's the key in marriage. This is vital that you understand that he must be the one in your marriage all the time. From the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed, the rest of your marriage. He's the one that makes you a dynamic duel, not yourself. Not what Jim Holmberger tells you. He's the one. You must import Jesus Christ. It's been the hardest lesson of my life, in my individual life and my marriage life. I would have to learn to filter. And I don't always like doing that. But filter everything through Christ. Why? Jesus filtered everything through his father. He says, my father and I are one. Because he's the light. He's the life. He's the one that makes you a dynamic duel. So you learn to filter everything in your marriage. This is key. 
This is vitally important. We talked about it uh, to a degree in, in part one. Now we're re-emphasizing it in part two because it is so vitally important that you enter into this, not just mentally, but experientially. So in my hash brown potato episodes, I should say my white, brown, my, my white sloppy potatoes episode, was I filtering? In the story they just gave, was I filtering everything through Christ? When I sat down as the head elder and I prayed, and she puts these sloppy white potatoes, did I filter what my response was going to be? No. No. Are you? When your spouse rattles your cage a little bit, says something you don't like, or you disagree, do you filter at that particular point? Was I receiving wisdom and power from on high? Yes, I was. I was receiving it. It was coming in. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so you may say that the Lord is my helper. God never leaves us. He's always there. He's always by our side. He's always whispering, Isaiah 30, 21, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, Jim, this is the way. Was I acting on that wisdom and power? No, that was the problem. I was receiving it, but I was resisting it. I was the one in charge. How about you? Was the problem Sally? <laughs> no, it wasn't Sally. Well, it was the problem sloppy white potatoes? No, it wasn't sloppy white potatoes. Was the problem my business? No. What was the problem? Come on, you all know what the problem was. The problem was me, Jim Ownberger. I was the problem. I wasn't allowing God to be in charge. I had religion, but I wasn't God governed. And that God governed needs to go into everybody's marriage. And most marriages are man managed. And that's why they have problems today. So I was the one in charge. I was resisting God and I wasn't cooperating. I was the one. Each of us need to look in the mirror and that's not very comfortable. It's easy to go and look at everybody else in the world or in your business affairs, personal affairs, or in your church. I had to do something drastic. So we did something drastic, and you're going to have to do something drastic too. It may not be the same as what Sally and I chose to do, but God is calling you to do something drastic because your marriage is stale. It's on the rocks, or it's just plateaued. Or it's, or it's headed for divorce or separation. I don't know. You know. And you have to make some changes. So Sally and I, what we did is we ultra-simplified our life. We sold our beautiful all-cedar log home on 40 park-like acres, and we moved to the wilderness of Montana. We sold all our possessions. We sold my business. We sold all our vehicles. And we ended up in a 960-square-foot cabin up on a little plateau in the wilderness of Montana where there was only grizzly bears, elk, and moose, and deer, and Sally and I, and one other person, the presence of God. Because when you simplify your life, God's with you wherever you are. You may be in New York. You may be uh, in Paris. I don't care where you are. God's with you, but you can't recognize it so easily there. In this setting, we could recognize God's presence with us very easily. No phone, no TV, 50 miles up a gravel world. And there, the Lord taught us what was missing. It took us years to figure out what we are sh sharing with you right now. And you can learn uh, in a very short period of time what took us years to learn. Because you can go through our experience and you can see if you identify, because the solution is pretty much the same. Some of the little specifics may change or alter, but the core of the solution is the same. John the Baptist said it well. He said, I must, he must increase and I must decrease. Wow. What did that mean for me? I had to put my wife before me. I had to put the Lord before my wife and me. He must increase. God, God-centeredness, a God-governedness, not a man-managedness. 
We run into this in marriages all the time. Sal and I were working just this past week with a young couple. They've only been married a couple of years and they're ready for divorce. And as we work with them, one of the two you could see was just unwilling to let God in. And the other one was willing to let God in. And if the one doesn't let God in, there's not much hope for the marriage. I don't know if they'll hang on. I don't know what they'll do, but uh, the one is coming over this afternoon. I'm taking them with us. We're going to talk further. He must increase and I must decrease. Yeah. What's God saying to you right now? So simple example of that. Very, very, very simple example of that. And how sensitive we need to be is at the time we were living in that log cabin, we had a loft and our, our bedroom was upstairs and I was coming out of the bedroom, I had a little desk there for my morning worships. And I was coming down the stairs because Sally was making a meal and I could smell it. We're going to have family worship. And at that time, Sally, and at this time too, actually, <laughs> typically makes the bed. And as I'm walking down the steps, the Lord whispers to me, who's in charge of your life when God whispers, Jim, go back up and make the bed. <laughs> so what do you do when God whispers to you? I'm not asking you if you want to make the bed. I'm not asking if it's your chore in your home. When God whispers to you, to your conscience, what do you do? That's the key to becoming a dynamic duel. Letting God manage your marriage, not yourself. When you let God in and he whispers to you, you say, yes, Lord. So I said, yes, Lord. And I went back up and I made the bed the way my wife likes it made, not the way I make it. You may say, well, that's no big deal. Yes, it is a big deal. Because Isaiah 2.22 says, cc from man. That's the key to allowing God in. You must cease from Jim Hornberger. You must cease from managing your own life. You must let someone else in to oversee your life and guide you. That's what Jesus Christ did. That's why he came to the planet Earth. And he said, I can of my own self do nothing, not even make a bed. God's in charge. That's the key. And because we don't allow that in our marriages. That's why over 50% of marriages end up in divorce today. And the 50% that don't divorce, 70% of that 50%, that's be another 35%, are just coexisting. They wouldn't remarry the same person. So you had 50% and 35%, you get 85% of marriages are miserable today. Only 15% really come out shining. Not a very good average, is it? So what about you? What percentage are you? Just ask Bob and Karen. We received a phone call. Bob was on the other line and he says, Jim, can you come and help us this weekend? Uh, our marriage is in serious trouble. And when I got there, Bob says, let's go for a walk. He didn't let me come in. Sally went into the house and he says, Jim, Karen's gonna divorce me if I'm not a new creature in Christ by the time you leave, late Sunday. <laughs> this is Friday. <laughs> I says, Bob, you can be a new creature. You got to let God in. Got to let God be in charge. Karen has to see this no longer Bob. So I took him to a very simple Bible verse, uh, James 1.19. Let every man be swift to hear, swift to hear the still small voice to our conscience, our, our mind, our hearts. Swift to hear, slow to speak, filter everything and slow to anger. It's not very complicated. God didn't make the gospel complicated. He didn't make the avenue for finding it or becoming a dynamic duel complicated either. So who really is in charge of your thoughts? I asked Bob. I said, who really is in charge of your mouth and who's in charge of your temper? Are you gonna allow God to come in? So this was in a crisis situation. I brought him to James 126, if any man, uh, among you seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, this man's religion is vain. And Bob was the head elder of his church. And he had no control over his tongue. 
So we discussed it. I told him that vain means it's of no value. It's useless. I said to him, I said, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I don't, know, I don't think they do this anymore, but uh, my parents would take me to Dr. Bill and he'd sit me up on his, his uh, table in his uh, uh, office. And the first thing that Dr. Bill would do is say, stick out your tongue. And he'd take a tongue depressor and he'd look inside. And God is saying, you know, the tongue is a measure of whether you're sick or not. And your tongue is a measure of whether you're a Christian or not. And your tongue has a lot to do with whether you have a, a great marriage or not. So we discussed it. We went into uh, breakfast the next, next morning, and his wife had made a big pot of oatmeal. And um, he had prayer, and he stood up, and he started serving himself. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking at Bob like, Bob, open your ears. And all of a sudden, he just stops serving himself, and he takes the plate, that the bowl that he had for himself, and he hands it to his wife. I wish you could have seen the look on her face. I think it was the first time he ever served her outside of their honeymoon first. She was shocked. And then he looked at my wife, took her bowl, served her, served me, served his, his two children. And he served himself last. I said, yes, yes, God's getting through. Bob's listening. And then as we're eating, he's telling a story from his past reminiscing a little bit, really getting into it. And uh, his daughter interrupts him, actually rudely interrupts him. And uh, he just fires back at her with hard, coarse words. In the midst of those, those, those freezing words that just shut down a young girl, he stopped. He's listening. He's listening to God be in charge. God's whispering to Bob right now, Bob. So Bob looks at his daughter and says, I'm sorry, honey. I shouldn't have said that to you. And everybody at the table is shocked. They're seeing a new Bob. Sunday afternoon. So the whole weekend went like this. Sunday afternoon, we're sitting there. We're about ready to go home. And Bob's... Uh, Gives had an opportunity to give one of those those jabs to his wife, where everybody's supposed to laugh, supposed to be fighting, but the wife hurts inside. And he goes through and he starts giving this jab to his wife, and he stops again in the midst of it, and he looks at Karen and says, "I'm so sorry. I have done this to you for over 21 years. Will you please forgive me?" And I was saying the switch from Bob being in charge to allowing God to be in charge. I wonder what your video would show. If we could play out your video for the last week or month in your home, would it show that God's in charge or would it show that you are in charge? What would your tongue check show like with me, with Dr. Bill? This is an index to who we really are, and it's an index into why our marriages aren't working. So you have to ask the question, are you gonna be God-governed or man-managed? That's the question to ask. It's very sincere. If we could type an email right now, send an email up to Jesus Christ and say, dear Jesus, you paid your life for me. You're the master, you're the arbitrator. Uh, of the hundred entreaties, that you called my heart out for in the last week, what would my percentage be to how I responded to you? For the last 100 entreaties, how many of those 100 did I respond favorably for? What would your percentage be? I think most people in most marriages would rate pretty low. A good marriage might get 50%. A fantastic marriage, whether it's in the church or other church, might maybe hit 75%. So what would your response be? That's why, because your response is so low, Satan keeps you so active 
that you've got no time to find this experience. I'm going to read just to give you a sample of what Satan convention was like in order that you cannot become a dynamic duel. I want you to enter into this convention that Satan had with all his evil imps in order to destroy the world and to destroy the church. This was his game plan. I'm actually taking this from my book called Escape to God. Satan, in his address, said, we can't keep Christians from going to their churches. And they do. They go to their churches. We can't keep Christians from knowing truth, from saying their prayers, from entering into lifestyle reforms. They are going to do it, and Christians do do it. But time is the essential ingredient, for without time, they will never find an intimate abiding experience in Jesus or a walk with God. That's why God sent us to the mountains to gain back our time so he could wake us up. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you the devil's game plan of what we did. If they gained this, if they gained their time, we have no power over them. So distract them from gaining hold on their Savior, for this is where their power is. The evil angel shouted, how shall we do this? Keep them busy with the non essentials of life. Divert them to pleasure-seeking, materialism, and gaining more and more and more of this world. Get them to spend and spend, then get them to borrow and borrow and borrow. Convince them that happiness comes from things. Induce the husbands to work six days per week, 10 to 14 hours a day. What is God saying to you right now? Make it so that the wives have to work. Then they'll have no energy for their marriages. And without their marriages in place, their families will fall apart. And without the families, the foundation of society, society will fall apart. Overstimulate their minds, bombard their senses, flood them with phone calls, emails, and text messages. Keep them involved in their churches, overcommitted in their social lives. Keep them busy, stressed, and tethered to the things of this world. This will keep them from gaining hold on Jesus in their lives and in their marriages and in their families. Without this connection with God, they'll be ours in the end, merely foolish virgins. Bring them on board the treadmill and increase the speed faster and faster and faster. Escape to God, page 26. In the midst of the swirling tornado, that all of us find ourselves in. And you have your own swirling tornado. You can probably add to that or subtract some of that, but you got your own swirling tornado. And in the midst of this, God is speaking. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way out for you. What is God saying to you right now? God wants to revitalize your marriage. He does. He wants you to be a dynamic duel. He wants to empower your life. He wants his life to shine through you. And God is no respecter of persons. God, if he has done it for me, he'll do it for anybody. It doesn't matter if you belong to a church or not a church. God threw his life down for everybody in this world. Absolutely everybody. And our responsibility is to learn how to listen to the still small voice that voice is written in the Bible, and that voice attends our conscience every day. And we have to listen. That's why we read our Bible, so that we have a conscience that's sensitive to the still small voice of God, because he's the one that directs our marriage. He's the one that makes it a dynamic duel. And so we go to his word, we go to his spirit, and we say, God, I'm listening. And then we have to filter everything that comes to our day such as when we're walking downstairs and God whispers, make the bed, Joe. Yeah. What are you doing when God whispers to you? Probably isn't dealing with making the bed. Maybe it's doing dishes or I don't know what it is. God has a thousand things he wants us to do that reconnect the marriage together. And he picks and choose, chooses which one. Ours is to listen, to filter it, and then to choose. That's all Bob did that. By the way, they put their marriage back together. One weekend. 
he became a born again Christian one weekend, Friday night to Sunday afternoon, because he chose. He chose to go. Let's see how it works. So let me show you the opposite of my hash brown potatoes. I call this washing my hands, dear. And I've shared this before, but it's a classic. The first one was a classic that wake me up, hash brown potatoes. And the second was a classic that I found it. It works no matter what. I was on my garage. I was fixing a chainsaw, got my hands full of grease and oil, came in the back of my log cabin. Right there on the left is the bathroom. I had the sink turned on. I had my hands full of soap. Having a beautiful day with the Lord. And my lovely wife comes walking out of the kitchen. She stands in the doorway. She looks at me and says, what you doing, dear? And that's when the devil hit me. That's a stupid question. That's what the devil's whispering in my ear right now. Can't she see that she's wa you're washing your hands? And so now I've got the opportunity to listen, to filter, and to choose. What are you doing? I switched from sloppy potatoes and throwing my wife out of the house to listening to God, to filtering it through God. And I looked at my wife and I said, washing my hands, dear. And the victory was mine. We're in love today. Why? Because Jim Holmberger is no longer in charge. I let God be in charge. That's why I meet with God every day in the morning, not just to memorize a text or, or to enter into theological discussions, but to give glory back to God. It's the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him. The only way you can give glory to God is to reflect his character in your everyday life and say, Lord, I'm here. Use me as a vessel to first love my wife, then my children, then my church, then the world to touch other people's lives. It's not complicated, is it? But will you enter into it? Isaiah 2.22, we shared that a little bit earlier. See she from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein shall he be accounted of? I had to cease from Jim Holmberger, and I had to let God be the life and the light of my life and my marriage. Not complicated. That's why Sal and I are dynamic dual, because she does the same thing, and it's beautiful. God takes your, your individuality and your uniqueness, and he blends it into one beautiful match that you couldn't have had by yourself. So have you ceased from self? Because this is the issue in every marriage. What are you going to do? Are you depending fully and entirely on Christ working in you and through you? And cooperating. It wasn't until Moses, if you go back in the Old Testament, and Moses was called to lead his people out of bondage. And God calls us as men to lead our marriages out of bondage, to lead our families out of bondage. But it wasn't until Moses found himself self distrustful, slow speech, and timid that God called Moses to deliver Israel out of bondage. And that's what I had to find. I had to be self-distrustful in my own marriage. I had to become slow speech and timid. Unless Jim Holmberger rises up again, and rather than Christ in me and through me. Moses said this, when God finally called him to deliver his people out of bondage, Moses says, who am I? Who am I? Moses realized he was nobody, that only as he let God indwell him would he have the power to do it. He says, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt, Exodus 3.11? Who are you? That's the question that you have to ask. When Moses resolved this, in his life, he became a tool in the hand of God. And when you realize this in your life and you let God in, you will become a dynamic duel in your marriage as well. Stay tuned for part three, which will be my wife. 
focused on her. She loves giving that message. And then I'll I'll have part four focused on him. I love giving that message. And then we'll have part five, which is extravagant love. Stay tuned because we want you to become a dynamic duel and a tool in God's hands. God bless you.